Hi everyone, uh, this is lecture three of ET350. Today we're going to take a little bit of a deep dive into Faraday's law. Um, some of this will be a little bit more for curiosity's sake, but I just wanted to give you a perspective of uh, how the equation works, how would you apply it um, in kind of our simplified classroom way, and then how would one look at it outside the classroom in a more formal way. Uh, we want to look at permeability. This is going to be that uh, uh, Greek letter mu. This is the material constant that allows us to transfer flux. Uh, we are going to look at Ampere's law and we're going to look at two specific situations. One is the single wire and one is the coil. These are going to be two useful equations that uh, it would be good to memorize. Um, and then we're going to look at two examples. One where we have two wires and we'll look at how two wires with current either attract or repel each other depending on the current direction within the wires. And then we'll look at an example, a railgun example, uh, where um, we have a sliding projectile and how magnetic fields and current and all that stuff make this projectile move. All right, so let's start with our deep dive into Faraday's law. Um, but Faraday's law, remember, is you get voltage induced with more d phi dt, right? So the equation is this, V induced equals minus n d phi dt. So that's going to be the equation we're going to be using class. And to be honest, this minus sign, yes, it represents Lenz's law, and yes, it represents uh, uh, the opposition, how the V induced is induced in such a way to oppose that dT, or all right, that change in flux. Um, but for for most cases in this class, we actually ignore this minus sign, and you'll see why. If we want to include this minus sign, it, it's it's a bit of a complicated process which involves some contour and surface integrals. I will explain it, but you can skip that part of the video. Uh, and, and really not miss much. But if you're curious, please watch. All right, but this part don't skip. Um, so in order to get more voltage induced, we need to figure out how do we change the flux, right? How do we get this time rate of change of flux? And recall from our definition of flux, that's one of the seven fundamentals, uh, flux, if everything is uniform, then it's B A cosine theta. And remember, that's just a definition of also a dot product. Theta is the angle between the normal vector A and the flux density of the field. Uh, and A is the uh, scalar magnitude of the area you're looking at and B is the flux density. And here's a little picture of it. So if I have some river of flux density, this field of flux density, we're assuming uniform flux density, a flat area, and there's some angle, I'm gonna capture more magnetic flux from this flux density field if my A is aligned with B or if that theta is zero. If that A starts moving more perpendicular, perpendicular then I'm gonna ca catch less flux. Now, that being said, if I wanna get a D phi dt, like the derivative of this flux, I can do three things. I can either spin this, I can have a D theta dt, which is gonna cause a D phi dt. I can increase and decrease the area, or I can increase and decrease the B. So there's three ways to change this flux. And by changing that flux, I'm going to get more voltage. All right. And that's summarized in these three lines. Okay. Now, again, we have this equation. V induced is minus N D V D T. I have that written here. And I want to just review that simple example we went over in class, uh, in, in, or the last lecture, sorry. And imagine we have a loop of wire. And this constitutes our area, just like this. And let's say I have an external magnetic field pointing in this way. So it's like a magnet sitting here and the north end is pointing that way. And like we had before, if the magnet starts moving closer, the B value gets bigger. So you, that is how we're gonna create a dT in this loop, right? Now, Faraday's law and Lenz's law does not like this. And so the way we are gonna analyze this in the class is we're gonna think of it as well, what would oppose that B? Well, a B oppose, a magnetic field in the opposite direction would oppose that B, and what's a current due to Ampere's law that would support the B oppose? Not this external B, but the B oppose. Well, using our right-hand rule, we can see that an induced current going this way would support this B oppose and fight this increasing B. So if you had a resistance here, you would start setting up a positive voltage on this side and a negative one there, if that makes sense, okay? So you'd get circulating currents like this, all right? Now, if you were to take that, that same magnet and move it away, 
then that B would decrease and the B oppose would flip and the I induce would flip. And that's what this picture is here, right? If you had that same B, but now it's actually getting smaller, this, this says, hey, hey, don't leave. Uh, why don't you stay a little longer? And it sets up a B opposed to fight that leaving, okay? But let's keep this original one. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a little bit of a deep dive into the formal equation of Faraday's law. And I know it looks a little bit nasty. It is kind of gross. You have our classroom version. In fact, like I said, we're gonna kind of ignore this minus sign. But then the more general official version of Faraday's law is this contour integral E dot DL equals minus D, D, uh, DT of this integral B dot DA. Oh my God, this is scary. Let me try to break down this equation into a little more gentler way. If I look at this D phi DT, great, no problem. Uh, I'm assuming one loop here. If I have multiple loops, then I have this N. I minus sign, minus sign, great. B dot DA, integral of B dot DA, well, that's just the definition of flux. We actually saw that, so that's actually phi. Excellent, so you've seen this before. You see this before, great, minus, minus, okay, not so bad. Then you look over here and you're like, integral of E dot DL, what is that? Well, let's recall, what is E? E is an electric field. And an electric field is essentially, uh, the larger the uh, electric field, the larger the forces on the charge, because here's the defin uh, definition. If you have a charge and you are exposed to a larger electric field, you have a bigger force, right? So if you have a big electric field, E, and you have some positive charge, it's gonna push this with a larger force than if you had a small electric field, okay? Now, let's, if we look at the units, let's, let's think about what's going on. You have an E times an L. This is an electric field, this is a distance. Okay, so if we break down the units, in this case, we see that electric field has units of newtons per charge. Okay, no problem. But what happens if we multiply the electric field times some distance? Well, then you're going to have newtons over charge times meters. Hmm. Hmm. Well, let me see if I can combine the meters and newtons. Newton meters per coulomb, okay. And if I recall, Newton meters is actually the same as a joule. Hmm. This looks familiar. This is actually a volt. A joule per coulomb or energy per charge is a volt. So if we look at this integral, that's actually the same as a volt. Excellent. So I hope you can see that this kind of more complicated, more general equation reduces down to our simplified one that we're going to use for our class. This one, I think, gives us a little more intuition, although it doesn't account for as many things, whereas this one will account for a lot more complicated things, right? But I just wanted to show you, in this case, where does this minus sign come in? Because like I said, in future problems, we're going to um, uh, ignore this minus sign a lot, set up our system to make sure the B opposed like this kind of comes into play without having to worry about this minus sign. However, if you th use this formal definition, you can use the minus sign. And I do want to show you how in the slide. So if you want to skip ahead to the next part of this video, uh, past this slide, feel free at this point. Or for your curiosity, you can pay attention. All right, so let's look at what's going on here. We got to make some assumptions. Do you guys see this DL and this DA? Well, they kind of go hand in hand. And what you're assuming is, is that you have a surface with a DA, some little DA, right? This is your little DA. And the DA has a normal vector, DA vector, that's this. And if you have the edge of it, you have a DL, which is just a little, you know, chunk around this DA. Okay, so DL. And the direction of DL and DA actually are connected via the right-hand rule. It's a right-handed basis kind of thing, okay? So if the DA was pointed down, let's say, on the, in the other direction, then the DL would point it the other way, okay? So let's just keep this in mind, all right? Um, let's say we have a system just like this one. And what I wanna show you is that this system and this system, this analysis is gonna come with the same result in that you're gonna have an I induce going around uh, clockwise, okay? So let's say we have a loop, we have a contour, okay? We have a contour. We have some area, we have an area vector, okay? You got the area vector. And we have, by this little right-hand rule, a DL going around like so, counterclockwise, okay? 
All right, in this case, if you have this area and you have this DL, and let's say you have some external B, that's that B, and it happens to be increasing. So that means this DB DT is, is greater than zero. So that means this whole thing here, not including the minus sign, is positive, okay? So what is going on here? Well, it's saying that you have a negative E dot DL, right? Because if I solve, for this, in terms of this, that negative sign means that this is the op this e is going to be the opposite direction because of that negative sign. Well, if we know that dl is going in this uh, counterclockwise fashion, negative of dl is going to be going clockwise. That means you have an electric field going clockwise. If I have an electric field going clockwise, that means by their definition of uh, an electric field, force equals charge times an electric field. If I had a positive charge here then it would be pushed in this direction. Well, what is a positive charge being pushed in this direction? Well, that's current and I induced being pushed in this direction, okay? And so what you can see here, I've written it out a little bit more informally, you have minus dB dt times A, which is essentially your d phi dt. This is your voltage. And since E dot dl here, the integral of E dot dl is negative because of that negative sign, the electric field is opposite of DL going this way, and therefore the I induces in this direction. This is, yeah, a little bit more cumbersome to use. I prefer going down this route where you just go, well, ignore this negative sign. Just go, well, if I, I know that if I have some loop and I know B is increasing, uh, I know there's going to be a B opposed in the opposite direction, and to support that using Ampere's law, I'm going to have this, okay? I like the, doing this. It just it makes it a little bit faster. I we can go this way, but I think it's going to we're going to get lost in the sauce going this route. Okay, all right. But notice this I induce would oppose this DPDT because if you had an I induce going this way, you are going to create a B opposed in this direction to fight that increasing B. Okay, everything is consistent. No problem with there. However, I like this way a little bit better. But yes, we're going to be a little loose with that minus sign. We're kind of going to ignore it for the most part. And you'll see that again later when we do the railgun experiment or the railgun analysis. Okay, let's keep going. Okay, permeability. So permeability is the, um, what do you call it? The ability of a material to support a magnetic Field. So steel, iron, those are going to be materials that support a magnetic field, whereas wood, plastics, you know, those things don't support a magnetic field. All right. Uh, four things to remember. It, permeability, the physical quantity. The symbol is the mu. Uh, the unit is a Weber per amp meter, Weber, WB over AM, or equivalently a Henry per meter. So both of these are the same thing. Weber per amp meter is the same as a Henry per meter. Okay. Some common values. Mu of a vacuum, or sometimes we write mu naught or mu with a little sub zero here, is 4 pi times 10 to the minus 7 Weber's per amp meter. Uh, mu of steel, 1.26 times 10 to the minus 7. Notice like a thousand times greater than a vacuum, so much better. Uh, mu of iron, 2.5 times 10 to the minus 1 Weber's per amp meter. So iron is even better than steel by another thousand, right? Okay, and so your material, like if you if you look at those motors, they use special types of iron um, to, to make those laminated sheets so that they get a high permeability and very effective magnetic flux transfer, okay? Uh, this is a proof for the units of mu. Um, what we're doing here is just looking at that original kind of equation of uh, Ampere's law. Remember, we ignored that DEDT. And B is Tesla, DS is meters, and I is amps. And we can just see that, well, what is mu? It's a Tesla meter over amp. And we know a Tesla is a Weber per meter squared. And you can see this easily chips away, meters cancels with the meter squared, and you get Weber's per amp meter as the mu. Another thing, you know, again, this is just for your own curiosity. Why is a Weber per amp meter the same as a Henry per, per meter? Well, we can bring in our old friend, the inductor equation, V equals LDIDT. That's from your ET250. Uh, a volt is a Henry amp per second, right? And so we can see that a Henry is a volt second per amp. And that means that we have, we know that a volt second is a Weber. And so a Weber per amp is the same as a volt second per amp is the same as a Henry, right? 
And so you can see that Weber per amp is the same as a Henry or Weber per amp meter is the same, same as a Henry per meter, okay? So these are all, you know, good things to do. Uh, not required to memorize this, but I just, you know, I just figure for those that are curious, they can see this. If not, then skip ahead. Okay. All right, now let's go into two useful Ampere's Law's equation. And again, let's just stop and review. We got seven things. We got the definition of flux. We have the uh, Lorentz force, that's from this cube, right? We have the B convention north to south. And then we have the four Gal uh, Maxwell equations, Gauss's Law one and two, electricity and magnetism, Ampere's Law and Faraday's Law. We're on Ampere's Law right now. We just talked about Faraday's Law, okay? Ampere's Law, um, <clears throat> We had two uh, right-hand rules, one right-hand rule for a wire and one right-hand rule for a coil. And let's look at the single wire. And this is gonna be the useful equation for a single wire, right? So if you have a wire and you have this wire surrounded by some material with some material constant mu, so this, could be, this wire could be wrapped around iron in which this mu would, uh, would go to iron, or it could be just a plain wire in air. So again, this would be the four pi times 10 of seven. If that's the case, if I want to calculate what is the flux density at a given distance away, I could use this equation, right? Notice as R, so this R is the distance away. If R gets bigger and bigger and bigger because R is in the downstairs, B is gonna get smaller and smaller and smaller. That makes sense, okay? As I get closer and closer to this wire, R is getting smaller, therefore this whole thing is getting bigger and I get a larger flux density, okay? And remember, what is the uh, direction of B? Well, we know by the second right-hand rule that the direction is always swirling around with a right-hand sense around that current, okay? Um, and then these are just summarizing uh, how these different parameters affect B. More mu, more I, less R, more B, okay? All right. Now, again, this is more for curiosity but this is how that equation gets developed, right? Again, you can skip ahead if you wanna skip the proof, I will go over it. So here's the proof. <laughs> the general equation for Ampere's law was this, uh, ignoring the DEDT part. This is an integral of B dot DS, okay? Remember an integral with a dot product here is just adding up all the B, D, B DS cosine theta, right? This number be becomes larger if DS and B are more aligned. A cross product gets larger if the two vectors are more perpendicular. Okay, so let's look at a simple situation. Imagine my wire is now coming out of the page and the current's coming up. And I've just picked some circle. We know physically that the B circulates around. So that means at any point on this circle, the B is always tangent and constant in magnitude around the circle. Okay, so let's imagine I'm looking at a little DS and a little and a B right here at some radius away, okay? And so I want to find, well, what is this B at this radius using this equation? I know it's going to be constant at least. Well, if I do this integration around here, if I take ds times B, ds times B, ds times B, if I keep doing that, what is the integral of ds all the way around the circle? Well, it's the circumference. And assuming B is a constant, this C is a circumference, we know what the circumference is in terms of R. It's just B equals 2 pi R. No big deal. So that means B two pi R is equal to mu I enclosed, and therefore we get this equation, all right? Okay, not too bad, not too bad. So this B here is gonna be, like I said, bigger if R is smaller, bigger if I is bigger, and mu is bigger, okay? All right, so let's look at the next equation for a coil. So if you have a coil of wire, now it's slightly different. So I'll bring the other equation up, that's right here. <clears throat> It's gonna be slightly different. So here's your coil. And what are all these terms? You still have a mu. So imagine you have some core, right? This is like a metal core. And the mu then would be whatever metal this is, okay? The N is the number of turns you have around that core. And the I is the current or in the coil. And L is this stack height. And we're gonna make an assumption that this length is much greater than this radius, right? So it's kind of a thin aspect ratio. All right, and so again, how does B get bigger according to this equation? More I, yep, that makes sense. More number of turns, yep. Um, a larger mu, yep. And a shorter distance, right? The, the, the shorter the stack, actually, the larger the B, okay? All right, good. 
So again, we can look at the proof. Again, you can skip ahead if, you, if you're so inclined, but if, you, if you're also so inclined to uh, learn about where this comes from, from Ampere's law, pay attention, no problem. Okay, so for this equation, we can again go to the general version of Ampere's law, integral of b dot ds equals mu i enclosed, and uh, again, I'm ignoring the DET. So let's look at a situation here. I have a coil. And what I'm doing is I'm choosing a rectangle that is perfectly cutting this, uh, what do you call it, cutting these wires. In this situation here, I chose a circle cutting the wires. And my choice of circle was very nice because along that circle, B was constant, right? In this one, my choice of rectangle you, you will see is also very nice. And here's the reason why it's very nice. On this length, of this rectangle, the B is nearly zero because the flux density comes in here very tight and compact, large value, and then spreads out. And then here, B is essentially zero over here, even very close, okay? Uh, inside, B is very strong, and the B and the L are, are, are in line, nice. Now, out here, we're gonna assume that the DL, or the DS part here, is perpendicular to D. So if you do a dot product of something that is perpendicular, you get zero, same with down here. So you're gonna get zero, zero, zero. So the integral of this becomes very nice because all it cares about is this guy here, this length, okay? And the mu I enclosed is the mu and this is the I that encloses this surface, right? <clears throat> and we're gonna multiply it by N because there's N number of, of currents cutting through there. So again, just reiterate the integral of b dot ds on the left side is, well, we have one to two. That's the only non-zero component. Two to three, three to four, and four to one, boom, those are zero, right? Because these two perpendicular, this one b is zero, okay? And so all you're left is b times the integral of ds along this length. Well, that's just b times l, easy. So b l equals n mu i enclosed. Not too bad. So B equals N mu enclosed, I enclosed over L. So this is that equation, okay? Um, like I said, is the proof really necessary for understanding this class? No, it's just for curiosity. What is important is that you know that this equation exists for a coil. You know the assumptions that you need to uh, use this equation, right? And you know where it breaks down, all right? So now we have two equations for Ampere's law, one for a single wire and one for a coil, okay? All right, let's move on. So now we wanna look at a very straightforward, well, not straightforward, but kind of tricky. Actually, I, should, I take that back. Maybe it's a little tricky. Uh, example of two parallel wires, right? And we're gonna have parallel wires with current running through it. So here's our system. We have two wires and let's say we have I1 and I2. And let's say both currents are one amp. And let's say these wires come in and for the length of one meter, they are together and they kind of separate. So this one meter section has current running through, running through with one amp and it's 0.1 uh, meters away from, from each other and it's in air. So we're gonna use mu permeability of a vacuum. And the question is, what is the force on each wire and what is the magnitude and direction? Okay, and what are some useful laws? Well, we have Bill's law we're using the cube and we're gonna have Ampere's law, <clears throat> right? And uh, here's Ampere's law that we just went over. And this is Ampere's law for a single wire, not the coil, good. And Bill's law, F equals BIL. And we're gonna assume that the magnetic fields and the currents are perpendicular. Otherwise we can't use this equation, right? And yep, if right angles, okay. So let's look at the very first scenario uh, where uh, notice the currents are in the, in the same direction. And let's look at how wire one produces a B field, okay? So if we look at wire one, you're gonna use our second right-hand rule, thumb, current direction, fingers, flux density. You guys got that? Okay, good. And so um, if I look at how this current affects, makes, creates a flux density, and we'll call it, now be very careful, I'm gonna have one and B1. This B from Ampere's law is from that I1. And around this wire, it's creating a flux density down and into the page. If I was on this side, it would be up and out of the page, but because it's circulating around, it's down and into the page, okay? So I have an external flux density and I have current. Well, now that screams out, use the Lorentz force first right-hand rule. That's this cube. 
okay? So now I go, okay, if I have current here, I'm gonna take this line, this is current, and I'm gonna take this flux density, and it looks like it's going down into the page, then the force is going to towards the other wire, in fact, okay? So now the, um, the force F2, I2 and F2 is actually going this way. Notice I called it F2 because it is the force on this second wire, right? Um, and notice how I'm being very careful about my Bill's law equation or Lorentz force equation, right? I'm saying F2, the force on this wire, is equal to B1, the external flux density, times I2, its own current, times L, the length of, of, of wire exposed to this magnetic field. I'm very careful about these um, new notation, right? Now we know from our Ampere's law, we just found that this B1 is actually mu I1 2 pi over R that goes in here. And we know that R, the distance away is, is W, 0.1 meters, and mu is mu of uh, a vacuum, okay? All right, so let's be careful. B1 is mu I1 2 pi W times I2 times L. Excellent. And now we can put, punch in numbers, four pi times 10, 10 to the nine, minus seven, one amp, one amp, one meter, two pi times 0.1, and we get two times 10 to the minus six Newton. Very small force, but there is a force nonetheless. So that means if you have a lot of coils wrapped around, imagine a lot of coils wrapped around with a current in the same direction, there's actually a force <coughs> squeezing them together, right, if that makes sense, okay? I suppose if you get a, two wires with enough current running through it, you might be able to put a big enough force to start really compressing down those, uh, uh, what do you call it, insulation in between, right? So, um, but that's kind of nice that coils of wire actually hold together as opposed to push each other apart. That'd be kind of annoying if you made a coil of wire and every time you applied current, it like exploded on you, right? Okay, so F2 pushes I2 towards I1, good. I bet you if we do the another, uh, other analysis, we're gonna get the same result. So let's look at I2, how it creates its own external field. And so again, Ampere's law on I2, it's gonna create a B2, and on this side is actually coming up and out of the page, whereas over here, B1 was going down and in the page when it was on this bottom side. So this I2 is coming up and out of the page, right? And uh, we can use again our Lorentz force and see, well, which way is the force direction F1? And you can see I is going, I1 is going this way, B is going up out of the page and F is going towards I2 by that first right-hand rule. And this is by the second right-hand rule or the Ampere's law, okay? All right, and if we use Ampere's law for this one, we get mu I2 over two pi R, no problem. And if we look at Bill's law, F1 equals the external flux density times its own current times L. So F1 equals I1L times B2, the external one. Okay, and now we can take this and plug it in and we get mu I2 I1 L over two pi R. Isn't that the same equation as this? It is, yay, okay. So it's the same force, 2 times 10 to the minus six, but in the opposite direction, pulling those wires together. Good, so F1 pushes I1 towards I2. If I had two currents, one going up and one going down, then I would imagine they would push each other away, okay. Um, but yeah, I hope this, I know it's a little bit tricky, but I hope by making sure that all your notation and, you know, your thought process is straight, you're getting a deeper understanding of the intuition behind these equations. Okay, this is our last example. It's a simple rail gun. <clears throat> all right, so let's see what's going on. Now we're going to combine Ampere's law and Faraday's law and the Lorentz force into this one, right? So this is good. You had Ampere's law and Faraday's law, the Lorentz force here. Uh, maybe not Faraday's law, but you had Ampere's law and the Lorentz force. Here we're going to have uh, definitely Faraday's law and the Lorentz force. So what do we have? We have some voltage source, we have some resistor and a switch. We have a powerful magnetic field going into the page and we have a projectile that can slide left and right. Everything is uh, conductive, right? And you can imagine if I were to close the switch because I have the positive sign on the top, current's gonna flow in a clockwise fashion, right? Notice I've set up a dimension X here and X is gonna hopefully get bigger as I apply current and this thing's gonna slide away. All right, let's make sure that we got our B in the right direction. 
because it wouldn't it be sad you close the switch and the projectile shoots towards you that would be no good so let's see if i were to close the switch and current's going down let's double check so current goes down b goes into the page yay f <laughs> goes to the right excellent we did a good job right okay so uh when the switch closes good we did this analysis correct this is consistent with our <clears throat> what we just found so some question is what is F, like how, how much force are we applying to this projectile? Does F change over time? Like once you get this thing up to speed, does F keep in uh, staying constant? Does it decrease? Does it increase? What does F do? Uh, what is the speed? Or at least how would we find uh, an equation for the speed? And does the speed change? Does it get faster, slower, so on? Does, does it bottom out or does it remain constant? What is it? So these are some questions that we're going to answer in our analysis. Okay. Okay, so the strategy we're going to do is we're going to solve for this current because <clears throat> if we can solve for this current using Bill's law, we can solve for the force. So let's first solve for the current. Um, uh, <clears throat> sorry, I guess we're not going to solve for the current. We're going to solve for, <laughs> we're going to look at Faraday's law first. Okay, so Faraday's law says V induced equals minus N D phi dt. Remember, we're going to be a little loose with this minus sign. Yes, we know that this minus represents we're opposing change, but we have that V induced equals N D phi dt. Okay, we'll assume N is one because we have a uh, single loop here. And don't forget our definition of flux, V equals BA cosine theta. And let's say this is our area, okay? If this is our area defined by X and L, we don't see the area rotating relative to B. We, in fact, we don't see B changing its value. It's just staying constant. But what we do see is that this area as this projectile slides could get bigger. So we're going to get an A from this, or sorry, a D, D A D T, right? Which is going to cause the D F D T. All right, so if I took a derivative of both sides, I'd see that B is constant. This goes to one stays constant. I have L times X, these two L times X. The L stays constant, but it's really this X, which is gonna uh, be active here. And so we have D phi dt equals B L D X D T, which results in this equation. All right, how do I model this? Now, like I said, we're gonna be a little sloppy with this minus. What I'm gonna do, instead of accounting for this minus, I'm gonna account for it <clears throat> by how I set up this voltage. Now this voltage, I'm actually putting an independent voltage supply and representing, representing it as this projectile. Okay, and notice I'm setting it up in a way such that it's going to oppose this current, right? Because I put the positive terminal here, okay? So if I do a nodal Ohm's law, I equal, across this resistor, I equals the voltage at uh, the before the resistor minus the voltage after the resistor over the resistance itself. This is ET250101, right? I equals VS minus BL DXET over R, okay? Um, and so that's why I use the positive version here, okay? So let's take this equation, right? So yes, as promised, we are solving for the current, but we did start with Faraday's law first. And let's rewrite it, okay, Vs minus Bl dxdt, dxdt. And let's see what kind of conclusions that we can draw to try to answer some of these questions, right? I'm not gonna give numbers. We're just gonna use this equation to talk about how we would get answers for this. Okay. So when you start, <laughs> when you're at the beginning here, what's going on? I is zero. The velocity is zero. The position of this thing is at uh, some nominal value and it's stationary and the dx dt is zero. So this is zero, this whole thing goes away. And it looks like I would be the maximum value possible once you close the switch. So the second you close the switch, you actually get the most force on here, okay? Um, and so I want you to think of this, if you've ever driven a Tesla, like the, the, the Model S, it's the same idea. Any electric car, electric bicycle, when you're at rest and you punch that accelerator, you close that switch, you will feel the most torque and force at that low speed moment. And it's because this BL DXT, this, this back EMF term, right? This back EMF term is zero and it will let the most current flow. And we know from Bill's law, the more current, the more force, right? F equals BIL. Okay, so you get the most acceleration in the initial start. As the projectile speeds up, 
this dx dt becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. Well, well, what happens? This voltage starts increasing and matching this voltage here. At a certain point, these two terms match and your I goes nearly to zero, right? Eventually Vs and Vl dx dt match. When this occurs I equals zero and according to Bill's law, the force goes to zero. So yes, the force does change and eventually the force goes to zero, right? So initially the force is Bill's law B times this value Vs over R times L, right? This length here, okay? All right, but at, at, at top speed, the current goes to zero and you are now at terminal velocity, right? And you're at the fastest it can go. And at this state, dx dt is maximized. So what you're gonna see is this velocity shoot up and then just stay constant if there's no friction, right? And it's just gonna hold, okay? All right, but that's kind of the analysis of how, and, and once you have this, then you can do more things with it, right? But this is the fundamental kind of uh, analysis of a, a, a lot of electric devices, electric motors, right? Uh, you're gonna see that at a low speed, you're gonna get the most torque and force, and at a high speed, you actually fall off. And if you ever watch those Tesla uh, drag races against uh, maybe a gasoline powered car, uh, it might win, but if it's a long enough distance, what you might see is that the Tesla takes off because it has that high acceleration first and then the gasoline car lags, but then eventually at the higher speed, uh, the gasoline can, car can come up, catch up and pull away, right? And so that's, uh, that's definitely related to this whole back EMF term. Very, very interesting stuff here. All right, thank you for paying attention and I'll see you in class. All right, have a great day, bye.